Um, before I get started, though, I just wanted to kind of mention something. I think it was Julian that mentioned something about awareness and, and making sure people know about the fact that there is a space station up there. And so every chance I get, I try to tell somebody about it and the fact that it's actually kind of close and it's going really fast. But I also try to tell them to use spot the station. Who in this room, raise your hand, has gone outside some night or some morning and seen the space station go over? All right, good. I'm preaching to the choir then. So <laughs> if you don't know, though, spotthestation.nasa.gov. Put in your city and it tells you when uh, it'll be passing overhead. And it's really, really cool to see. So take advantage of that. Um, we heard yesterday about some incredible advances that are taking place on the station uh, with regard to in-orbit manufacturing. It's, it's truly amazing. And additionally, there's a growing number of ISS facilities and capabilities that provide fertile ground for research into a variety of materials, processes, and properties, which can benefit exploration programs such as Artemis, um, Generation Artemis, as well as us right here back on Earth. So here to lead our panel discussion on these capabilities is Dr. Kurt Costello. Dr. Kurt Costello is the International Space Station Chief Scientist. In his position, Dr. Costello is responsible for ensuring science leadership at the highest level within the ISS program office, representing all research and researchers on the space station. He provides independent scientific advice to the program regarding NASA research, ISS national laboratory research, international research collaboration, and scientific communications. Prior to joining the ISS program, Dr. Costello was a mission operations lead, an international space station training lead, and a power and thermal systems instructor. Dr. Costello led the crew and mission training for the ISS 12A.1 and 1J assembly missions. Dr. Costello completed a PhD in space physics and astronomy at Rice University in 1998, where his research was focused on the application of artificial intelligence to the prediction of solar wind transport and the global response to space weather disturbances. Please welcome Dr. Costello. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I hope everybody's really enjoying the conference so far. We've had some great technical sessions. We've had some great policy sessions. And today's panel, we're going to tackle some more technical topics. Um, we do material science research on the space station, and that spans the gamut from early conception, fundamental research into materials properties, all the way to applied uh, materials research. So we've got three panelists, but before I introduce them today, I just want to start off with a material science joke. Hmm. Okay, so why should the Silver Surfer and Iron Man team up? Because they make great alloys. All right. Now that you're all groaning through your lunch, let me go ahead and introduce our first panelist. Dr. Douglas Matson is an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Tufts University. Previously, he worked for 10 years as the lead test engineer in designing, building, and conducting vacuum thruster firing tests on satellite propulsion systems for the Aerojet Liquid Rocket Company in Sacramento, California and for three years as the lead materials engineer on the Space Shuttle Main Engine Technology Testbed Engine at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He received his PhD in materials engineering from MIT. He serves as a member of the National Academies Committee on Biological and Physical Sciences in Space and has two ongoing space collaborations on the ISS a thermophysical property measurement program using the JAXA Electrostatic Levitator, or ELF, and a solidification phase selection experiment using the ESA Electromagnetic Levitator. In a collaboration where he serves as the NASA facility scientist and chairman of the investigators working group. Please welcome Dr. Douglas Matson. Can't figure out the theme song.
Next up, we have Mr. Jim Holmes. Jim holds a BSEE and an MSEE degree from the University of Connecticut. Jim joined Ozark Integrated Circuits in Fayetteville, Arkansas in 2012 as the chief technologist to lead the development of extreme environment application-specific integrated circuits. Modules comprised of silicon germanium, silicon carbide, silicon on insulator, and gallium nitride processes. He directs the development of UV detecting and high temperature products, and he holds two US patents. From 2010 to 2012, Jim provided consulting services to fabulous IC design centers in the US in the need of low cost front to back analog mix signals, design capability based on open source electronic design automation tools. Jim has also held positions at Linjuent uh, and Texas Instruments. Please welcome Jim Holmes. And finally, we'll welcome Dr. Dmitry Startabov. He's the chief scientist of FOMS, Inc. and visiting research faculty at USC in electrical engineering. Dr. Startabov has been the technology officer at IPG Photonics, director of bio and nanophotonics at POC, and a technology officer of USC startup D-Star Technologies. He is the author of 26 US patents, over 100 publications, and recipient of the 2002 Photonics Excellence and 2012 Photonics Prism Awards. Dr. Startabov is a senior OSA member and a fellow of SPIE. Please welcome Dr. Startabov. Our panelists will now tell you their stories about the research they've been doing on board the space station and the results from that research. So I hope you're ready to hear their stories. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Matson. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, if you could uh, find the slideshow here. Good. So today I'll be uh, briefly talking about the motivation for the research that we're doing on the station. I'll be going uh, into some of our recent results and then uh, come up with some very short conclusions on, on how this you know, has meaning to the world. So first off, um, why do we need new materials? Well. In the human exploration of space, we uh, will be looking at uh, using metals in space a lot, and, and that's what my research has to do with, is looking at metal properties and how metals will then be successfully used uh, both during spaceflight and during colonization. And so we need to understand how to make better products and increase safety and reliability for these very challenging missions that we see ahead. There's exciting new prospects that are being developed in terms of how to manufacture uh, space hardware that this research will support. And that not only supports the space industry and, and, and missions, uh, expanding mission capability, but also supports ground-based commercial and military uh, aviation industries. And finally, uh, Molten metal is very important here in the United States and across the world as a major component of many structures, and therefore we're trying to help them with developing new transformative technologies that will make better materials for increased safety and reliability. Um, so first off, just a brief history. Space welding, uh, first conducted in the 60s, the late 60s by the Soviets. Uh, the first attempt, uh, they were inside the Soyuz uh, capsule and they came this close to burning a hole through it and killing themselves. Um, so in subsequent missions, the Soviets were quite intelligent and they said, let's do it outside the station now. 
And so the, they, they did a, a bunch of different tests. Uh, they had a female astronaut doing some really cool experiments, and they were very successful. And there's been a, a limited amount of looking at welding in space since then. Uh, you can see on the, the bottom there of the picture that there's a huge difference between welding here on ground and welding in space. Particularly, you can see that this structure welded in space has a, a relatively uh, homogeneous distribution of defects, whereas on ground the defects tend to be concentrated uh, in regions that we really need to understand if we're going to be making good quality products here on Earth. Um, so, for safe operations, you need to be able to model the fluid characteristics and the flow that's occurring within the weld pool, and therefore we need to know the properties of that metal. So what happens if you're on Mars and you lose a tool? Well, that's my um, socket set. You can see there's a, a hole, whoops, wrong one, sorry about that. There's a hole there where there used to be a socket, it's missing. I lent the tool set to my daughter, it disappeared somehow. I'm blaming her, I would never have lost it. But what do you do if you're, on, if you're off the surface of the earth? You can't go down to Walmart. Uh, they haven't, obviously, it's still blank to this day. But if we could manufacture parts in space, then we wouldn't have to carry a whole bunch of extra tools. I mean, that weighs a lot. So if you lose a tool, say, a crescent wrench. Why bring three of these? Let's bring the plans and make them there. And so most of you have seen this, the videos on additive manufacturing capabilities. This happens to be a, a, a piece of, this is plastic. You can also make this uh, out of metal materials. We're using different uh, manufacturing technologies. There's a huge effort at Marshall right now. Um, this uh, image that, that uh, this movie that was put together, my, I asked my grad student to, to make one of these wrenches for this presentation, and he was, this is the best project I've ever asked my grad student to do. He, he made a couple of these things and kept them. So you, you'll notice in the picture that it's blue and this one's white. Well, that's because he kept them. Um, in, a, in any event, if someone after the talk would like to see this, uh, I'd be glad to show it to you. It, it actually, you know, it, it, it works. It's very cool uh, what you can do with 3D printing. But NASA is doing some even cooler stuff. They're making turbo machinery, rocket chambers, injectors, heat exchangers, and cryo systems, all using very complex internal shapes with this new technology. It's transformative here on Earth, and it enables us to do new space activities that weren't possible in the past. Welding, I mentioned earlier. Well, in welding operations, you can see on the right there, there's a picture of a weld. Anybody who's seen welds knows about those little scallops that form. Well, how do they form? Well, it turns out that this is a mathematical model done by some colleagues in, in the University of Pennsylvania. And this shows the flow of molten metal inside the weld pool. And you can see that the, the material is being pulled to the back edge where it's colder. That leaves a ridge, and that's why we see these ridges in welding. And the curve on the left here is a, uh, an evaluation of the material properties, that's the surface tension, because the surface tension is greater at low temperatures. See, it's, it's higher at low temperatures and lower at high temperatures. That means the surface right here by the weld will be pulled out to these colder exteriors at the edge of the pool. That creates this circulation, and that's very important for controlling the defects in a weld pool. So what we want to do is we would like to have good mathematical models so that we understand what's going on in our processes. Furthermore, we can apply these mathematical models to casting operations. And these three, these three simulations were uh, done by colleagues at the Austrian Foundry Institute. Uh, the first is going to be modeling um, temperature as a function of time. You fill a mold. So you can see how the um, material gets cooler over time. For some reason, my microphone is cutting out. I apologize. Um, and you can also see complex flow with 
on the second one, this tells us temperature. And so we can track not only the flow within there and the looking at the temperature, but also the velocity. The second one's velocity, sorry about that. And then the, so the last one is solid fraction. Solid fraction is important because the last part to solidify is the part that has the highest number of defects. So we can now look at the structure and make sure that the defects are controlled and aren't in a critical location. So again, modeling activities are very important. And in order to do good modeling, we need to have good thermophysical properties. So that's what our project is looking at. We're looking at solidification and phase selection. And we're also looking at molten metal properties in order to build better models to support higher fidelity castings on Earth and enable new technology for space systems. Well, the work that I do is conducted uh, in collaboration uh, both with JAXA on uh, material properties and at the electromagnetic levitation facility uh, from ESA. Now the JAXA collaboration is yet to get started. We don't have experiments and this was supposed to be a, a, a detail of recent results. So I'll be talking about the electromagnetic levitation facility that's being run uh, right now on the ISS. Um, here's a video. I apologize it flashes a little bit. That's because we uh, very much like the microphone cutting out. We occasionally lose, lost frames as they were being transmitted down from the space station to ground, so that's why it flashes. But what you're seeing here is the, a droplet that's being processed, and the curve up here shows temperature. The blue curve is temperature as a function of time, and the droplet is rotating wildly as it's, go, as it's being melted. But then we turn the power off, and the sample starts to cool. As the sample starts to cool, we will excite the sample by applying a pulse, and that pulse will cause the sample to oscillate like this. And you can see uh, the sample is calming down right now, and now we're going to apply a pulse, and there it goes. That pulse is shown on the bottom here. This is the area as a function of time. And we can get from observing this pulse, the surface tension, due to the frequency of those oscillations, and the viscosity based on how much, there's a second pulse that's just been applied. So we get viscosity in terms of how fast those pulses dampen out and the sample becomes quiescent again. And then finally the sample will solidify and you'll see that as a flat video. It will get suddenly brighter as the temperature increases and that occurs right now. So now the sample went from back from liquid to solid. That's what a general test looks like. Additionally, if we use ultra high speed video, this video images were taken at 30,000 30, frames per second. The previous ones were taken at 150 frames per second, so very slow. This is very, very fast. And so what you'll see here is, these are the conditions that we can run the sample in space. We can have low stirring, the green dots, or high stirring, the red dots. And if we compare those results to our ground-based tests, the green dots appear up here, which re relate to the, uh, want me to use this? Okay, thank you. The green dots over here relate to the samples that have very little stirring, whereas the red, red dots, there's lots of stirring. And the delay in nucleation, the time between transformation of one phase to another is significantly influenced by convection. This was a big surprise. And so we've been developing new models to allow us to predict when these, these different phases form and therefore how we can control microstructural evolution within castings. So I want to try to see if I can play that um, video one more time. The video on the left, the green one, okay. So the video on the left, the green one, is with very, very low stirring. And you'll see that the first phase grows across the sample completely before the second phase forms. That corresponds to a long delay time. That green circle there. Then the other image is this red circle. That relates to some tests that were done with stirring. And here, the second phase forms almost immediately after the first phase. So it's very much influenced by convection, and, and that allows us now to investigate 
what's going on in industrial castings here on Earth. So, our conclusions. We have found that there's a, a new solidification model that relates phase transformations and stirring. And we've been doing evaluations on many new materials that are important to the space industry in order to get good material properties in order to make better parts. And so if in final, in closing, I'd like to thank uh, colleagues across the globe for collaborations uh, from ESA to JAXA uh, to the Soviet Union to China and, of course, here at home with our NASA engineers and other colleagues at other universities, we have this collegial experiment uh, 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 um, methodology where we, we don't just one run experiment, one experiment on a sample, multiple investigators look at different things on the same sample, and that gives the U.S. taxpayers their money's worth. And again, I'd like to thank NASA for funding my work. Thank you, Dr. Matson. Just before our next speaker, I want to remind everyone, we're taking questions on the ISS RDC app. Please submit your questions for a question and answer session at the end through the app. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor to be here to meet, to meet Kurt and uh, this distinguished panel. So a little about Ozark Integrated Circuits. Uh, we're a small SBIR-funded company. Um, so we've been leveraging the non-diluta funds out of the SBA office to drive our technology and our IP forward. As you can see, we're, we're conveniently located in a flyover state. Um, but uh, you know the ISS is kind of a great level for that. With the ISS, we're all in flyover states. So uh, we, that's one of the things we appreciate most about it. So, our material of interest is, is silicon carbide. Um, and, and so why, why silicon carbide? Well, um, I won't go into all the, the details of the material itself, uh, but with the application space, uh, silicon carbide really has a lot to offer uh, the, uh, the technology community. Um, number one, uh, silicon carbide is enjoying the, the high density and miniaturization and Moore's law that you saw with silicon for the past 30 years. So, Silicon carbide technology is, is leveraging a lot of the same tools and equipment uh, used to develop silicon systems. And so with silicon carbide, we can access that miniaturization path in the same way. Also, silicon carbide pre presents high reliability in, in extreme environments where you have dramatic temperature cycling like you would see in a jet engine. You know, the temperature profile in a jet engine can go from you know, minus 55 degrees C in Anchorage, Alaska, and then, and, and the engine heats all the way up to, to 500 degrees C, and then it has to land again. So extreme temperature cycling, the, the, the resilience of silicon carbide is, is really great there. And then just for ultra high temperature, uh, silicon carbide is, is now the, the leading technology that's, that's uh, pointing towards Venus exploration and Venus landers. Uh, the, the technologies with silicon carbide there are, are really are really, are, are really quite astonishing. And then sort of one of the unspoken uh, aspects of silicon carbide is with ultraviolet detection. Um, we have customers who have silicon-based uh, UV detectors that degrade over time because of the intensity of the UV. And silicon carbide has some of the properties of silicon and some of the properties of diamond, which makes it really tough in these, these extreme environments. So with respect to the wide band gap of silicon carbide, um, what we see here is uh, this, this uh, ability to sense UV light in the 100, 140 nanometer range to the 360 nanometer range. And so it's, it's vis-IR blind, so it doesn't see infrared or visible light, uh, but it can detect these, these deep UV ranges with high reliability. So for all you electrical engineering nerds out there like me, I will let you stare with jaw-dropping astonishment at the gain of this transistor while I talk to everybody else about other stuff. Um, uh, the, te the technology that we're bringing to bear is, is, a, is a UV NPN. It's a phototransistor that takes light and converts it to current. And so having a high gain of, of current allows you to take infinitesimally small photocurrents from the photoelectric effect and convert them into a useful signal. And what the technology allows us to do is to array these devices in a lot of different ways. So, so uh, those the little rectangles, 
to see if I can use the laser. These little rectangles here represent an individual electrically isolated transistor. We can put them in series, we can put them in parallel, we can drop them down like tiles and create really large, high sensitivity arrays uh, for detecting ultraviolet light. So on, on the bench, you know, in our lab, one of the things that we do is we do a, a classic ICE versus VCE characteristic. Um, and that's something we do on a bench with, with voltage sources and UV LEDs. Uh, so for, for all of you who are interested in electronics, this is a, a common experiment that you can do with a silicon uh, a bipolar junction transistor and a, and a light emitting diode is to create a, effectively an optocoupler. Um, and then you, you see the, the NPN characteristic on the right. So we uh, had a proposal into CASIS, and what we were trying to figure out was how do we take a simple benchtop experiment like this and translate it to the ISS? And so what we want to do is instead of UV using uh, you know, uh, man-made sources, we wanted to use solar UV, so there's no, there's no atmosphere between us and, and the sun, and just observe how these transistors, how, how this technology behaves over the course of a year. So we had to go, you know, learn the ropes of, of the, the space station, and, we, and through CASIS we were introduced to the, to the Missy uh, electronic experiment uh, uh, flight facility. And we were introduced to Alpha Space. They have a, a really great booth down in the um, exhibit hall. Um, and so we started working with Alpha Space, and they basically took us to school and taught us what we needed to know to translate our, our benchtop experiment to uh, their, their facility that is, that is uh, installed on the exterior of the space station. So basically, uh, this is a re really great opportunity for us to elevate the, the technology readiness level of our technology. So with, as with the ISS, I'm sure you guys all know that there's, there's sort of the bro code of the ISS, right? If, if it has wheels, then there's front, back, left, and right. If it's got wings and a rudder, you've got forward, aft, port, and starboard. But on the ISS, you have to learn about things like ram, wig, zenith, and nadir. So uh, we, uh, we, we, we dove in and uh, learned, learned all the, the, the terminology to, to, to access different orientations that were available to us so we could see sunrise, sunset, uh, look, and look straight at the sun. We didn't do straight, straight back towards the, the, st the space station, but uh, we, we used those different orientations to get three different measurements. And so, in so doing, he had to, to develop the electronics to interface with the Missy sample carrier, and uh, um, so we had to learn about you know the aircraft bus uh, uh, standard voltages and interfaces, and and put that all together. One of the great things about this this particular platform is it's got tons of flight heritage. So uh, there are just fantastic references and and articles by by NASA scientists and engineers who who developed. The, the communications and the, uh, the, uh, the architecture for communicating to the space station through MISI and then through the downlinks to, to a database. Um, and so we, we leveraged all of that to, to put this together. So this is our, our Ozark IC UV smart node, we, we call it, and it's, it's a simple PCB made of COTS components. COTS means uh, a commercial off-the-shelf components, so nothing fancy, and uh, we were able to, to to create this, the benchtop experiment, repeat the sweeps while exposing the, the devices to, to solar UV. So the software architecture that serves this uh, is, is, is really powerful. So uh, through Alpha Space, the, the ground station packets are received and recorded, uh, and they store everything for you, and, and, and so you always have a backup of the telemetry that's coming directly down in its raw form. In that raw form, it goes through a UDP or for right through the internet where we can receive it on, on, on a port, uh, expand the data and into a database where we can access it and, and observe all the data that's coming down. So we started getting telemetry about two weeks ago and uh, um, we're expecting about uh, half a terabyte of data uh, over the next year. Uh, but with the sweep data, we can see, uh, this is from the, the RAM orientation, you can see that it's always darkest before dawn. Right here, it's darkest before dawn, and then you have this abrupt sunrise as the ISS comes over the horizon and sees, and sees the sunrise. And then in, in looking towards the sunset, I think we're looking through some sort of lattice structure, some superstructure of the, of the space station, so we see, uh, we see uh, the sunset has 
like looking through some sort of a lattice. And then finally, with zenith, we get a classic parabolic shape uh, um, as, as the, the space station is, is moving on orbit. And so for each of these data points, we can, oops, let me go back. So for each of these data points, we can expand the data and see the IV characteristic. And so I just really want to say thank you to all our sponsors. Again, we've been uh, sponsored through a lot of the, uh, through the, the SBA, through a lot of NASA grants, and through CASIS for the, in the national labs to, to, get our, to get our module up into space, and just tremendous support from everyone. And as it was, as was mentioned earlier, that you, you forget a lot of these, uh, these uh, um, uh, centers, you think of them as institutions, but really it's just a lot of really cool people doing a lot of really cool things who really, who really took us to school and taught us what we needed to know in order to, to connect the dots. So we've been able to, uh, just in the, in the course of a year, be able to take our technology um, that has, had all been d tested on the ground and elevate its TRL level by, by putting it in space and, and running the experiments. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Holmes. Next up, Dimitri. Good afternoon. Right, uh, my presentation will be about optical fiber manufacturing experiments uh, on board of International Space Station. I think I probably, I'll try this microphone, yeah, about the same size, so no, the right. Right, so, um, the product that we make on International Space Station, we'll call it space fiber. The first uh, fiber that we were able to produce in microgravity uh, with my team uh, was reported in 2014. Uh, we were able to uh, fabricate about an inch of optical fiber on um, parabolic flight uh, of an airplane w uh, called Vomit Comet. You have my picture right there, trying to hold myself uh, to the fiber. So if you look at the pictures on uh, the left and the right, you could see that the fiber actually becomes better in microgravity. Why we are trying to make fiber, um, uh, new fiber um, in uh, space? Uh, turns out, if you look at the table, um, uh, regular fibers can, uh, made out of fused silica uh, can transmit light without amplification for about a few hundred kilometers. If you go to exotic glass compositions like uh, Z-Bland fluoride uh, optical fibers, you can go distances an order of magnitude longer. What this enables you to do, theoretically, is to transmit light between continents without uh, amplification uh, and transmit substantially more data. Uh, this is a big opportunity for um, optical communications industry. And uh, we learned that these fibers actually um, get better uh, when uh, they are made in microgravity. So uh, what's the market for uh, uh, specialty optical fibers uh, and how big it is? Uh, if you look at the graph on the right, you could see that the industry consumes uh, 10, uh, 20 uh, million kilos of uh, uh, material for making fibers that uh, are used in backbone of our um, uh, data um, communications. All the network uh, uh, capacity is uh, dependent on um, optical fiber transmissions. So, uh, the value of that market is such that if we, we replace just a few percent of um, uh, silica optical fibers with fibers fabricated in microgravity, then we will have million kilograms coming back and forth uh, to orbit um, every year for optical fiber manufacturing. Just this uh, project alone would mean 10x expansion 
um, of uh, existing um, uh, space operations. So it's a really big opportunity and it addresses the actual data market. Uh, all our cell phones are dependent on it. Pressing the wrong button. So um, uh, to check the sanity of um, uh, optical fiber manufacturing in space, uh, the best person to talk to is your accountant. So um, uh, you need something that would make sense uh, to manufacture in orbit. And uh, the picture in the uh, bottom right corner is my favorite one uh, from the movie Avatar. The gentleman pulls out a piece of rock and says, that's why we're here on Optinium, $20 million per kilo. That's why we're doing all of that. So um, if you look at um, specialty optical fibers, they are very thin, light, and uh, they are sold by a meter. Specialty optical fibers that are used in fiber lasers um, can cost a few hundred dollars per meter. Um, and a kilogram of um, optical fiber is somewhere between 15 and 30 kilometers of optical fiber. So if you look at value to mass ratio for optical fibers, you are in millions of dollars per kilogram for specialty optical fibers. It's not exactly an obtainium, but in the same ballpark. Uh, category. So it's very high uh, value to mass ratio product and if you can make it better on orbit, it does make commercial sense to manufacture it. So what did we do? We just uh, launched uh, our hardware to International Space Station and see what happens. Uh, our payload just came back from ISS. Um, you can see David. Uh, with our hardware, um, he installed it and commented uh, uh, good uh, hardware, good procedures, which made us very happy. So we launched two payloads. We did four successful remotely operated experiments on board of ISS, and we fabricated the first optical fiber on International Space Station. Um, just. Uh, and how it works, uh, we are in San Diego, California, and uh, everybody says, uh, you're lucky it uh, lands uh, uh, right next to you in Long Beach. Yes, it does. Uh, so what happens is uh, the payload uh, landed in Long Beach, then NASA put it on the truck, drove it to Houston, then we uh, flew to Houston, got <laughs> a rental, and uh, um, now the team members are very familiar with 22-hour drive from Houston to San Diego. So, so a um, uh, few nice pictures. Uh, uh, we um, completed calibration of our hardware on ISS. We know how to make a fiber. Um, uh, w uh, the picture on the left shows you that we can launch light and um, it actually uh, an optical fiber that uh, people can use. On the right you see the picture of um, uh, zoom uh, in on uh, the fiber. It's very uniform, nice, no um, imperfections, no crystals. So in fact we have demonstrated manufacturing of optical fiber on ISS, and we see an improvement of optical fiber properties uh, when it's made in microgravity environment. So the next step, we're going to build space factories, and we'll uh, be cranking um, optical fiber commercially on the International Space Station. That's our dream. So we want to thank uh, NASA team for incredible support. Uh, and uh, um, ISS National Lab, uh, Kevin Engelbert, uh, Ken Shields. Um, and uh, our next steps uh, would be expanding ground uh, processing operations and characterization of fibers and build the uh, customer base for uh, the fibers uh, that are now produced on International Space Station. Thank you.
Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, I think we have about five minutes uh, left for questions. So if we can have questions from the voice of God in the back of the room there. Can you, can you hear me? This is the voice of God asking questions for you all in this esteemed panel. So the first one is, for Dr. Matson, have you used computational methods to model convection within a droplet during a phase transition? That's the first part of the question. Okay. Would you like me to answer the first part before you get to another one? Sure. All right. Thank you, God. <laughs> It's nice to know my wife is right. God is female. <laughs> um, so yes, we, uh, we definitely do a lot of activity uh, to simulate what our space experiment is going to be, uh, the conditions under which our tests are going to be run. Uh, we use uh, something called magnetohydrodynamic modeling. And we have uh, collaborations with the uh, University of Massachusetts uh, under Professor Robert Hires, who does that for, he, he does a lot of that mathematical modeling activity and was one of the pioneers in that area. Um, and so, so we use this in order to control our experiments and make sure that they're representative of conditions on Earth. And as far as the, uh, the question you had on the effect of convection on the phase selection and, and uh, uh, transformations in that what I showed you was steel alloys. That actually is uh, a new mathematical model that I developed uh, based on the, the results that we got from space. Um, we couldn't get the data on Earth because on Earth we could either see zero stirring or highly turbulent and only in space could we control the convection and look at the region between. So it was uh, enabling for us to be able to go to space. All right, thank you. So the second part of the question is, to what degree do the convective forces affect the transition and how different do they have to be to affect transition dynamics? Uh, complicated question. I'll, I'll try to parse that down a little bit. Um, you may have seen uh, from uh, the, the graph that I had showed that you see about a tenfold change in uh, the transformation, how, how long it takes before the transformation occurs. What that translates to is uh, wide changes in microstructure. Microstructure is tiny little structures. So the defect structures, uh, the crystalline structures, et cetera, these are all influenced by convection to a large degree. And we need to be able to understand how those microstructural changes now translate to changes in performance of a material. And so that's the next phase of where we're going with our research. Thank you for that. The next question is, how do you plan to scale Z-Blan production in space to miles of fiber needed for intercontinental communication? The answer is uh, we have a current payload uh, capacity of around 100 kilometers. Uh, the next phase of the program will be building the stationary facility on International Space Station that will be loaded with manufacturing capacity. That's our plan to continue expanding our operations. And then the next phase will be probably building a fiber uh, and material processing factory on International Space Station. So 100 kilo, uh, kilometers per spool, and then you expect to, to grow that or keep those spools and just keep pushing them through the system? We'll be uh, pushing things through the system. Uh, we uh, have capacity of around 25 kilometers per spool, and uh, we just uh, send materials uh, up to the station and then send uh, the product back whenever we have a right. All right. Okay, we have one more question about the Zeblan. So, is the value proposition for Zeblan manufacturing in space still positive when factoring in transportation costs? The answer is yes, surprisingly yes. Uh, if you look at the prices of uh, going up and uh, down, the cost added to a meter of optical fiber will be about $1 per meter with current pricing. And the prices of few hundred dollars per meter 
uh, gives you a lot of margin with improvements uh, of fiber properties to actually be commercially successful with this operation. And then one last fiber question before our final question. Uh, please quantify the improvement in quality of the fiber produced on the ISS versus terrestrial fiber. Right now, we are in the middle of uh, evaluating uh, the uh, performance improvements of the fiber. So uh, we expect uh, to get few um, uh, times improvement in optical properties. But uh, at the moment, we are in uh, the range probably of, of around 20%. That, that's our guess. OK, I, I think we're out of time. I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers once again. And thank you all. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. <laughs> <laughs>